So I just want to start out with a massive thank you to NASA Gear for sending us these awesome NASA t-shirts. We don't do any advertising on the show currently, but we're more than happy to give a shout out to companies that are doing fantastic products, especially if they're sending them to us. You can take a look at the other stuff that they do through the link here and on with the show. Hello and welcome to this first in a regular series of astronomy news that will keep you up to date with the universe that we live in that we didn't know about just last month. Or as Eric Idle might say, this amazing and expanding universe. And Jenny, you have a pretty amazing story of survival. Yeah, so Hubble revealed a companion star that survived a supernova. Ooh. Just let that sink in. A star that survived its mate exploding in one of the most violent phenomena in the known universe. Holy shamoly! Let's dig into it. Now, it may surprise you to hear that most stars in the universe are not loners like the sun. It's far more common to find stars in binary or even triple or quadruple systems than it is to find them on their own. And while two's company, it does mean that fate has dealt you a precarious hand because your future is not just dictated by you. Stellar lives is dictated by one thing, mass. The more massive you are, the shorter your lifespan. And that's because more massive stars have to combat greater gravitational forces, so they burn through their hydrogen fuel more ferociously. The most massive stars live for just tens of millions of years, compared to billions of years for small sun-like stars. And stellar deaths, well, they're also dictated by mass. Now, small stars like the Sun, when they run out of hydrogen fuel in their cores for fusion to battle gravity, they progress to helium fusion. They swell up, puff off their outer layers, and then quietly progress to becoming dainty white dwarf stars swathed in the gentle glow of a planetary nebula. But massive stars, well, as if being the brightest and hottest of all the stars during their lives wasn't enough, they then have to steal the show in their deaths. So like smaller stars, when they run out of hydrogen fuel in their cores, they can progress to helium fusion. But due to their greater masses, they can progress to fusing heavier and heavier elements like carbon and oxygen, neon, magnesium, silicon, until they get to iron. Now, iron cannot be smashed together to produce energy. It actually requires energy to fuse iron. So once fusion ceases, nothing can fight gravity. The star collapses in on itself, rebounds outward in an explosion, producing as much energy as the sun does during its entire 10 billion year lifespan. Now, imagine you're a small star. Yeah, middle-sized star, maybe. Basking in the glow of your brighter, hotter mate. Life's looking pretty cushy. Until, when you reach middle age, and that bright spark decides to blow up right in your face. Will you survive? (laughs) (laughs) Well, it seems. Yes, you can. Even if you and your mate are in a very close orbit. So close, in fact, that as your more massive mate was slowly dying, fusing heavier and heavier elements, puffing up into a red giant, you decided to siphon off some of his bloated atmosphere. And although astronomers have discovered a handful of supernova surviving companions, we'd never found one in a close system like this before. The supernova in question actually went off in 2013 and, as expected, the ultraviolet light from the supernova slowly faded over time. However, Hubble spotted another point of ultraviolet light at the source of the explosion, which didn't fade. And that, the researchers argue, is the starlight of the surviving binary companion. The data seems to indicate that the supernova shockwave hit the companion star, jostled it like jelly, but overall didn't do any damage. The study also helps explain why some stars have lost their hydrogen envelope before they explode. Some argued that it was the fault of stellar winds, but now the culprit seems to be a companion. And as for what that system's doing now, well... The exploded star is very likely either a neutron star or a black hole, and eventually the companion will head in the same direction. Which then sets up a potential neutron star black hole scenario, and they will eventually spiral together and produce gravitational waves when they merge. So we now also have a viable formation mechanism for those compact object systems. 
I really love it when research comes together like this and it just like explains so many different things in stellar physics. Nice, nice. I love it when a plan comes together. Mm. For my next story, I am back in my homeland of galaxies and returning to some curious tiny examples that are causing astronomers all kinds of headaches. Now, a few years ago, a team of astronomers led by Peter van Dockham of Yale University reported the detection of two dwarf galaxies lacking dark matter. Now, this is an enormous problem because dark matter provided the gravitational seeds for galaxies right back in the early universe. Normal matter then accreted at these gatherings of dark matter and then, of course, the normal matter went on to form stars and all of the parts of the galaxies that we see today. So how can you get a galaxy forming without dark matter? It seems that rather than these being galaxies that formed without dark matter, maybe they had their dark matter stripped away. By reverse engineering the motions of galaxies, it seems that they may have formed from a galaxy collision about 8 billion years ago. So, in your mind's eye, dear listener, imagine two galaxies, not the two in question without the dark matter, but two reasonably small galaxies orbiting NGC 1052, and they collide. Now, for the stars, it was kind of like two swarms of bees colliding, only you could fit a couple of Earths in between each bee. So... Nothing to really worry about if you're a star. Now, same sort of happened with the dark matter, sort of weakly interacted with itself and the stars through gravity. But the gas, now that's different. The gas in the small galaxies took the brunt of the collision, was compressed and slowed down. Then you can imagine this gas almost being strung out behind the collision site, itself then later collapsing to form new dwarf galaxies without dark matter. Now, searching around NGC 1052, they found more unusual galaxies strung out like a line of pearls exactly where they'd expect them to be in the aftermath of a collision. But to be sure, the properties of the other unusual galaxies need to be better understood to make sure they really are part of the NGC 1052 system and they're not just sort of along the same line of sight. So this is one to watch out for. We should get more on this story once they've had a look with like the VLT and Hubble and James Webb. Now, that's really interesting. Mm, Yeah, anything that's sort of concerning dark matter is interesting. So are we starting to think, Jen, that this may be a mechanism for how dwarf galaxies come to be just more generally? Or is this maybe being seen as more of an outlier? Well, it's for the ones that are lacking dark matter. This is because the other ones will sort of form you know, from these little clumps of dark matter which collapse first because... um, they don't interact with anything, so they're only influenced by gravity, so they can collapse uh, first. Um, so we would, normal dwarf galaxies will have the dark matter, but this is to explain those ones which don't have dark matter in them. But I guess it could be a possible one for maybe like globular clusters. So I don't think globular clusters have significant amounts of dark matter, right? That rings a bell. We don't really know how they form. Mm. Because globular clusters are... They're so old. Yeah, they're relics from the early Mm. universe, right? So, and obviously in the early universe, you would have had a lot more galactic collisions. So maybe some kind of version of this might explain the formation of them. Because, you know, Mm. I mean, galaxies are like a sliding scale. You sort of, you obviously have the, like the most giant galaxies in the universe at one end, and then you end up at the dwarf galaxies. And then the line is kind of blurred between dwarf galaxies and and Mm. massive globular clusters, you know, it's kind of hazy. So yeah, might, might relate to that. Interesting. And then very quickly, I just wanted to touch on a story that will make professional astronomers, if there are any listening, absolutely poop their panties (laughs) because the stellar mass distribution of galaxies, it turns out changes with time what yeah this this made me poop my pants and i will i will very briefly explain what this is all about so whenever we try and work out the stellar mass of a galaxy uh, which a lot of other factors depend on um we can't do it by counting all of the stars in the galaxy we, we can't physically see every single star in a galaxy. Mm. So what we do is we detect the light from the brighter stars and then we use a model of the underlying distribution of stars to extrapolate from that light what the actual stellar mass content of a galaxy is. And this mass distribution of stars, so um, how many 
massive stars you have, how many middling sized stars you have, how many small mass stars you have. It's called the initial mass function, right? And we've always assumed that the initial uh, mass function, so the distribution of stars, is the same for all galaxies throughout space and time. That is the same for the Milky Way as it is in you know all the other galaxies. But it turns out, no, it looks like more distant galaxies have more massive stars overall compared to having smaller ones. And the more massive stars you have, the more supernovae you might expect. So that's all messed up now. That then impacts estimates of dust content. Stellar masses of galaxies have probably been overestimated. Star formation rates are probably wrong. But this new research might help us understand why galaxies die. And there's an awful lot to unpack. It's like a series of three papers and I haven't had time to get into them yet. But it just means that everything we thought we knew about galaxy evolution might be wrong. Oh, great. Wow, that's a gloomy thought. Now a cheery story of doom and destruction. Ralph. Yes, so the universe hasn't reminded us that we're all probably going to die in an asteroid impact for at least a week. Now, as we get better at detecting asteroids, we find that one has merrily zipped by us every few days. But long-time listeners to our podcast will know that just because most near-Earth asteroids are likely to burn up in the atmosphere or blow out windows in remote parts of Russia, and that it's easy to ignore things that happen frequently, nobody much cares about it anymore. It's like the next celebrity showing off their latest perfume line. If you do happen to notice it, you ignore it in the hope it'll go away. Well, an asteroid with the catchy name 1989JA wants you to take notice. As its name suggests, it was discovered in 1989. It's quite a unremarkable iron and magnesium rich asteroid about a mile across that orbits the sun every two and a half years. But it got a little bit close to Earth a few days ago on May the 27th, travelling at 30,000 miles an hour or 17 times the speed of your average bullet. Now at a kilometre and a half it would easily wipe out a city and cause problems for the rest of the globe if it did hit. Now, of course, we're still here, so it didn't. And crucially, we've known about it since 1989. We've known that it wouldn't hit us, but it is one of 16,000 Apollo-class asteroids whose orbit crosses the Earth's path enough for us to keep a really good eye on them. So, 1989JA came within 11 lunar distances of Earth and popped off back on its merry way, with NASA telling us that it won't get this close again for another 172 years. Now, at present, of all the known potentially hazardous asteroids, 2010RF12 has the highest chance of impacting Earth, with a 1 in 22 chance on September the 5th, 2095. But it's only seven metres across, so unless it's pure iron, it probably won't even make it through the atmosphere. And observations during the close approach this August should let us know for sure if it will impact Earth in 2095. And nobody wants to go out on a downer, but because we're not really worried about anything we know about hitting us for at least another hundred years, it's the ones we don't know about that give us the most cause for concern. And that's why programs like NASA's DART mission, see if we can deflect an inbound asteroid, are so important, and why we need to invest more in space surveillance to make sure we do see any new objects on a collision course while we still have the time to launch an asteroid redirect mission. Because, as the quote goes, if the dinosaurs had a space program, they wouldn't be extinct. I've just got one little thing to add to that story, hmm. which is if, if you can't really picture a kilometre and a half, it's also equivalent to 350 giraffes. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for that, Jen. <laughs> Three, is, that, is that 350 giraffes like laying down? So like you imagine like in a chain or, or standing up next to you each imagine other? Imagine them posture. like stood on top of each other's back. So it's like not on top of each other's heads. I mean, like yeah. that would just be cruel. Oh right, okay. Is a yeah. giraffe higher? So than it actually, is not wide? really including their neck. 
So actually, well, basically, you're talking about 350 decapitated giraffes. Yeah. Didn't want to say it. Because you're really just talking... It's oh, like don't, a tall horse. We don't include their basically, neck. Basically, yeah, 350 <laughs> really tall tables. <laughs> really tall horse. <laughs> so that's about a hundredth of a whale's, isn't it? In traditional weights and measures. Yeah. How many London buses is that? How many Belgiums is that? <laughs> a Belgian. <laughs> when, I, when I said whales, I meant without the H. <laughs> A big news story, of course, is, well, the supermassive black hole at the centre of our galaxy, the Milky Way. This, this is the surprising story, of course, that we took a picture of a black hole that was actually way outside our galaxy yeah. before we took a picture of the one that's basically just over the yeah. road. Why is that? Jenny, you're, mm. you're our expert in this field. Why is it that we got yeah. an, an image of M87... Years ago, mm. when I still had more hair and was less grey, yeah. um, and yet we've literally only just got our picture of of yeah. Sagittarius A. Especially because the data was taken at the same time, I believe. So it, that's how much longer yes, it's exactly. taken us to analyse data. And there's two reasons. Uh, the minor reason is that... Um, so when we're taking a picture of the black hole, what we're looking at is the superheated... Uh, disc of gas and dust that's orbiting the black hole. That's the emission that we're seeing, and then specifically, the torus, yeah. Isn't it? yeah, and specifically, mm. we're seeing synchrotron emission. So this is when um, charged particles are accelerated around magnetic field lines, and they emit emission in radio wavelengths. Because I think sometimes it's been a little bit confusing as to because they talk about how this disc of material is so hot. And yeah, it's emitting radio waves and you don't really associate hot with radio. Mm. You just associate it with like x-rays or something. But mm. but that's the emission that we're looking at. But anyway, when we're looking at our black hole, we have to look through all of, and I can't believe I'm going to say it, but all of the crap, all of the dust and the gas that's in the way. And um, <laughs> But in this instance, it is in the way. And so there is some radio emission from the, the gas uh, that's in our galaxy and then we have to kind of factor that out but the primary reason is actually the size of our black hole so our black hole is about four million suns worth and uh, that's significantly smaller than the uh, black hole at the heart of m87 and the black hole at the heart of m87 because of its great size is that although everything sort of going around it is orbiting at nearly the speed of light it has a much greater distance to travel. And so when you are looking at this black hole, you can assume that it's static basically over the course of a day or two, which is how long it takes to do these observations. So the black hole is not changing. Whereas our black hole, because it's so much smaller, everything's moving at the speed of light and it has far less distance to travel, the black hole changes its appearance over the course of half an hour and so we have to factor in all of this changing motion mm. in the exposures because these exposures will go on for hours and you know, you have different telescopes that are tuning into the black hole as the Earth is rotating and it's coming into view. And so that was the problem. It was trying to factor out all of this motion as best as possible. And that's why it took so much longer because it's obviously extraordinarily complex to develop computer software that can analyse the data to be able to do that. So that's why it's because there was loads of stuff in the way, but the primary reason was that our black hole is so much smaller. Mm. Yeah, it was basically like trying to look at the moon through the trees and clouds compared to an unobscured view. Yeah, it's which, yeah, you know, is, is in a kind of open sky. Is it, that that someone described it like that um, on 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 interwebs the other yeah. day that it was it was like the difference between looking up at a bright object in the sky with nothing in the way compared to trying to see something basically through all the stuff on the ground yeah. and it was much smaller. I tell you what else it was like as well is you know how like the London Eye moves really slowly. Mm. that's what m87 was like whereas uh, our black hole is like a spinning bicycle wheel in comparison yeah, yeah I like so that. when you're trying to sort of see what this spinning bicycle wheel actually looks like while it's spinning you know you're trying to get the static image mm. of it that's why it took so much longer but it is still extraordinary you know they, they connect up all these radio telescopes and they yeah. make a telescope that's equivalent to the size of planet earth yeah, as I say, this is this is this Event Horizon mm. Telescope, and this this isn't a telescope. It's not it's not. Let me call it that. Mm. It's not one telescope. It is a 
massive array of scopes, essentially kind of with with kind of the America. If you picture it, it's kind of like the Americas are, are sort of in the centre. Yeah. So North and South America are kind of like the the sort of middle, the midi, the median of the the the, 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 the telescope, and you've got stuff in Europe. You've got stuff going all the way to Hawaii. You've got stuff going down to Antarctica. Yeah, Greenland. And kind... Yeah, I imagine kind of like Brazil's about the centre, roughly, isn't it? It's kind yeah. of well, Chile, I suppose, and, and it, that, that's sort of the centre. And and it's like a disc that big. Yeah. It, it, it's huge. Um, but there's all the individual telescopes yeah. that are then joined up to, yeah, to, to, to do yeah, that. Yeah, so they pair the telescopes up to do conduct observations at the same time. And it's all mm. about exquisite precision timing of when those observations are taken because that's the key. Like, mm. they use these atomic clocks which lose something like a second every, like, million years or so, something insane like mm. that. And it's it's the, the timing precision that then allows you to combine the data from the telescopes so that you have essentially one, one giant telescope. Yeah. Uh, it, which is incredible and this thing the difference was I think it was like M87 is basically a thousand times more distant yeah I think it was wasn't it and then and and then our our, our, Mil- uh, our Milky Way black hole is a thousand times smaller yeah. so actually in a sense the image is almost the yeah. same it, it sort of looks looks the same size essentially but it's actually it's that kind of like looking at Venus compared to Jupiter in that they, they can sometimes like appear the same size in yeah. the telescope almost. But... Or the moon and the sun. Yes, yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, yeah, or the moon and the sun, exactly. But the resolution of this telescope is such that you could see a donut on the surface of the moon. Wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah. And it looks like a donut. A, radi- a radio donut. A radio donut, yeah. Because you can get the conspiracy theories like, well, why can't we take a picture of the lander then? Because yeah. <laughs> it's not radio. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's not actually radio, and this is incredible. And and again, it matched prediction as well. That that was what I I loved about that. They did this with M eighty seven as well, as they, based on what we knew about the centre of the Milky Way, they they created a model to show what they thought the the black hole would look like, and the image would they they were almost like the M eighty seven, but almost mm. identical. Yeah, it was. It just it was a. That was almost the most incredible bit for me. It was that that kind of here's what we think it was going to yeah, look it like, did. and bloody hell, yeah, the image actually matches it yeah. almost that's perfectly. That's how good we are now. And I think the most important yeah. result that's come out of this is that Einstein is still right. <laughs> he hasn't been broken oh, yet. When is that bastard going to be wrong? <laughs> <laughs> but it is. I mean, it's 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 a measure of his theories that. That still we we are we in a way we are desperately trying to prove him yeah. wrong because it would be great to yeah, to, that's how to do works, that yeah. Yeah, yeah kind of break yeah, yeah well we exactly. know he has to be wrong but at some just, point because you can't marry Einstein's just, theory with the quantum realm so he's wrong mm, somewhere mm. but we don't know where where yeah so far it's holding up but he's 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 so right about so mm. much that every time like this we try and you know you test it. It comes out right, and it, it's just incredible. Yeah. Here we are, you know, over a hundred years later, and we're still going. Yeah, do you know what? Exactly what we expected. It's exactly what he predicted. This is what his math says, and it is incredible. But it's. Um, I think if you've not seen this, you're probably going to be a little bit disappointed by the image, in that basically it looks like the M87 one. Yeah. It's not that and it's different. Fuzzy. It's an orange circle. It is fuzzy. It's a fuzzy orange circle. Yeah. But it's extraordinary what that fuzzy orange circle actually is. Exactly. And and it's probably worth just mentioning that you're not actually seeing the black hole. Yeah. Because that's actually another another point of confusion. That I've, I've had this when I've used the M87 one in, in presentations and things, where people say, oh, that's... And it's like, no, you, you can't actually see the black hole still. It's, it's not... It's not ever going to be visible because of its nature. You know, it absorbs no. all light. So it doesn't itself, the black hole itself doesn't emit any light. We just see the superheated material around it. Yeah, the closest we would ever yeah, get is the yeah. event horizon. And we see a little bit outside of the event horizon. But the event horizon is that point of no return where nothing, not even light can escape. But yeah, we see just a little bit outside of that with this superheated material. But for me, this is a lot like Pluto, you know, new horizons going out to Pluto in that it's one of those things that, you need it to complete the set you, because it, yeah. you know it's 
yeah. it's been hypothesized and it's uh, and it's you know the, the the theory around it is just so strong that you know we've always believed it would be there and there was very little chance mm. that, that we wouldn't have a supermassive black hole i mean we've seen We've seen the orbits of stars around it. Yeah, but, exactly. You know, to get that image is just so important to, yeah. to actually see the the disc around the black hole and know that it is there. And we've got a picture of it now. Yeah. Let us know what you think about any of these stories in the comments below. And there's more from us next week.